the dancing mania by justus hecker translated by dr benjamin g babington chapter one the dancing mania in germany and the netherlands section one st john's dance the effects of the black death had not yet subsided and the graves of millions of its victims were scarcely closed when a strange delusion arose in germany which took possession of the minds of men and in spite of the divinity of our nature hurried away body and soul into the magic circle of hellish superstition it was a convulsion which in the most extraordinary manner infuriated the human frame and excited the astonishment of contemporaries for more than two centuries since which time it has never reappeared it was called the dance of st john or of st vitus on account of the bacchantic leaps by which it was characterized and which gave to those affected whilst performing their wild dance and screaming and foaming with fury all the appearance of persons possessed it did not remain confined to particular localities but was propagated by the sight of the sufferers like a demoniacal epidemic over the whole of germany and the neighbouring countries to the north-west which were already prepared for its reception by the prevailing opinions of the time so early as the year thirteen seventy four assemblages of men and women were seen at aix la chapelle who had come out of germany and who united by one common delusion exhibited to the public both in the streets and in the churches the following strange spectacle they formed circles hand in hand and appearing to have lost all control over their senses continued dancing regardless of the bystanders for hours together in wild delirium until at length they fell to the ground in a state of exhaustion they then complained of extreme oppression and groaned as if in the agonies of death until they were swathed in cloths bound tightly round their waists upon which they again recovered and remained free from complaint until the next attack this practice of swathing was resorted to on account of the tympany which followed these spasmodic ravings but the bystanders frequently relieved patients in a less artificial manner by thumping and trampling upon the parts affected while dancing they neither saw nor heard being insensible to external impressions through the senses but were haunted by visions their fancies conjuring up spirits whose names they shrieked out and some of them afterwards asserted that they felt as if they had been immersed in a stream of blood which obliged them to leap so high others during the paroxysm saw the heavens open and the saviour enthroned with the virgin mary according as the religious notions of the age were strangely and variously reflected in their imaginations where the disease was completely developed the attack commenced with epileptic convulsions those affected fell to the ground senseless panting and labouring for breath they foamed at the mouth and suddenly springing up began their dance amidst strange contortions yet the malady doubtless made its appearance very variously and was modified by temporary or local circumstances whereof non-medical contemporaries but imperfectly noted the essential particulars accustomed as they were to confound the observation of natural events with their notions of the world of spirits 
it was but a few months ere this demoniacal disease had spread from aix-la-chapelle where it appeared in july over the neighbouring netherlands in liege utrecht tongres and many other towns of belgium the dancers appeared with garlands in their hair and their waists girt with cloths that they might as soon as the paroxysm was over receive immediate relief on the attack of the tympany this bandage was by the insertion of a stick easily twisted tight many however obtained more relief from kicks and blows which they found numbers of persons ready to administer for wherever the dancers appeared the people assembled in crowds to gratify their curiosity with the frightful spectacle at length the increasing number of the affected excited no less anxiety than the attention that was paid to them in towns and villages they took possession of the religious houses processions were everywhere instituted on their account and masses were said and hymns were sung while the disease itself of the demoniacal origin of which no one entertained the least doubt excited everywhere astonishment and horror in liege the priests had recourse to exorcisms and endeavoured by every means in their power to allay an evil which threatened so much danger to themselves for the possessed assembling in multitudes frequently poured forth imprecations against them and menaced their destruction they intimidated the people also to such a degree that there was an express ordinance issued that no one should make any but square-toed shoes because these fanatics had manifested a morbid dislike to the pointed shoes which had come into fashion immediately after the great mortality in thirteen fifty they were still more irritated at the sight of red colours the influence of which on the disordered nerves might lead us to imagine an extraordinary accordance between this spasmodic malady and the condition of infuriated animals but in the st john's dancers this excitement was probably connected with apparitions consequent upon their convulsions there were likewise some of them who were unable to endure the sight of persons weeping the clergy seemed to become daily more and more confirmed in their belief that those who were affected were a kind of sectarians and on this account they hastened their exorcisms as much as possible in order that the evil might not spread amongst the higher classes for hitherto scarcely any but the poor had been attacked and the few people of respectability among the laity and clergy who were to be found among them were persons whose natural frivolity was unable to withstand the excitement of novelty even though it proceeded from a demoniacal influence some of the affected had indeed themselves declared when under the influence of priestly forms of exorcism that if the demons had been allowed only a few weeks more time they would have entered the bodies of the nobility and princes and through these have destroyed the clergy assertions of this sort which those possessed uttered whilst in a state which may be compared with that of magnetic sleep obtained general belief and passed from mouth to mouth with wonderful additions the priesthood were on this account so much the more zealous in their endeavours to anticipate every dangerous excitement of the people as if the existing order of things could have been seriously threatened by such incoherent ravings their exertions were effectual for exorcism was a powerful remedy in the fourteenth century 
or it might be perhaps that this wild infatuation terminated in consequence of the exhaustion which naturally ensued from it at all events in the course of ten or eleven months the st john's dancers were no longer to be found in any of the cities of belgium the evil however was too deeply rooted to give way altogether to such feeble attacks a few months after this dancing malady had made its appearance at aix-la-chapelle it broke out at cologne where the number of those possessed amounted to more than five hundred and about the same time at metz the streets of which place are said to have been filled with eleven hundred dancers peasants left their ploughs mechanics their workshops housewives their domestic duties to join the wild revels and this rich commercial city became the scene of the most ruinous disorder secret desires were excited and but too often found opportunities for wild enjoyment and numerous beggars stimulated by vice and misery availed themselves of this new complaint to gain a temporary livelihood girls and boys quitted their parents and servants their masters to amuse themselves at the dances of those possessed and greedily imbibed the poison of mental infection above a hundred unmarried women were seen raving about in consecrated and unconsecrated places and the consequences were soon perceived gangs of idle vagabonds who understood how to imitate to the life the gestures and convulsions of those really affected roved from place to place seeking maintenance and adventures and thus wherever they went spreading this disgusting spasmodic disease like a plague for in maladies of this kind the susceptible are infected as easily by the appearance as by the reality at last it was found necessary to drive away these mischievous guests who were equally inaccessible to the exorcisms of the priests and the remedies of the physicians it was not however until after four months that the rhenish cities were able to suppress these impostures which had so alarmingly increased the original evil in the meantime when once called into existence the plague crept on and found abundant food in the tone of thought which prevailed in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries and even though in a minor degree throughout the sixteenth and seventeenth causing a permanent disorder of the mind and exhibiting in those cities to whose inhabitants it was a novelty scenes as strange as they were detestable end of chapter one section one chapter one section two st vitus's dance strasbourg was visited by the dancing plague in the year fourteen eighteen and the same infatuation existed among the people there as in the towns of belgium and the lower rhine many who were seized at the sight of those affected excited attention at first by their confused and absurd behaviour and then by their constantly following swarms of dancers these were seen day and night passing through the streets accompanied by musicians playing on bagpipes and by innumerable spectators attracted by curiosity to which were added anxious parents and relations who came to look after those among the misguided multitude who belonged to their respective families imposture and profligacy played their part in this city also but the morbid delusion itself seems to have predominated on this account religion could only bring provisional aid 
and therefore the town council benevolently took an interest in the afflicted. They divided them into separate parties, to each of which they appointed responsible superintendents to protect them from harm, and perhaps also to restrain their turbulence. They were thus conducted on foot and in carriages to the chapels of St. Vitus, near Zabern and Rotestein, where priests were in attendance to work upon their misguided minds by masses and other religious ceremonies. After divine worship was completed, they were led in solemn procession to the altar, where they made some small offering of alms, and where it is probable that many were, through the influence of devotion and the sanctity of the place, cured of this lamentable aberration. It is worthy of observation, at all events, that the dancing mania did not recommence at the altars of the saint, and that from him alone assistance was implored, and through his miraculous interposition a cure was expected which was beyond the reach of human skill. The personal history of St. Vitus is by no means important in this matter. He was a Sicilian youth, who together with Modestus and Crescentia suffered martyrdom at the time of the persecution of the Christians under Diocletian in the year 303. The legends respecting him are obscure, and he would certainly have been passed over without notice among the innumerable apocryphal martyrs of the first centuries, had not the transfer of his body to Saint-Denis, and thence, in the year 836, to Corvey, raised him to a higher rank. From this time forth, it may be supposed that many miracles were manifested at his new sepulchre, which were of essential service in confirming the Roman faith among the Germans, and St. Vitus was soon ranked among the fourteen saintly helpers, nothelfer or apotheker. His altars were multiplied, and the people had recourse to them in all kinds of distresses, and revered him as a powerful intercessor. As the worship of these saints was, however, at that time stripped of all historical connections, which were purposely obliterated by the priesthood, a legend was invented at the beginning of the fifteenth century, or perhaps even so early as the fourteenth, that St. Vitus had, just before he bent his neck to the sword, prayed to God that he might protect from the dancing mania all those who should solemnise the day of his commemoration, and fast upon its eve, and that thereupon a voice from heaven was heard saying, Vitus, thy prayer is accepted. Thus St. Vitus became the patron saint of those afflicted with the dancing plague as St. Martin of Tours was at one time the succourer of persons in smallpox, St. Antonius of those suffering under the hellish fire, and as St. Margaret was the Juno Lucina of puerperal women. End of chapter 1, section 2 Chapter 1, section 3 Causes the connection which John the Baptist had with the dancing mania of the fourteenth century was of a totally different character. He was originally far from being a protecting saint to those who were attacked, or one who would be likely to give them relief from a malady considered as the work of the devil. On the contrary, the manner in which he was worshipped afforded an important and very evident cause for its development. From the remotest period, perhaps even so far back as the fourth century, St. John's Day was solemnised with all sorts of strange and rude customs, 
of which the originally mystical meaning was variously disfigured among different nations by superadded relics of heathenism thus the germans transferred to the festival of st john's day an ancient heathen usage the kindling of the notfeer which was forbidden them by st boniface and the belief subsists even to the present day that people and animals that have leaped through these flames or rather their smoke are protected for a whole year from fevers and other diseases as if by a kind of baptism by fire bacchanalian dances which have originated in similar causes among all the rude nations of the earth and the wild extravagancies of a heated imagination were the constant accompaniments of this half heathen half christian festival at the period of which we are treating however the germans were not the only people who gave way to the ebullitions of fanaticism in keeping the festival of st john the baptist similar customs were also to be found among the nations of southern europe and of asia and it is more than probable that the greeks transferred to the festival of st john the baptist who is also held in high esteem among the mohammedans a part of their bacchanalian mysteries an absurdity of a kind which is but too frequently met with in human affairs how far a remembrance of the history of st john's death may have had an influence on this occasion we would leave learned theologians to decide it is only of importance here to add that in abyssinia a country entirely separated from europe where christianity has maintained itself in its primeval simplicity against mohammedanism john is to this day worshipped as protecting saint of those who are attacked with the dancing malady in these fragments of the dominion of mysticism and superstition historical connection is not to be found when we observe however that the first dancers in aix-la-chapelle appeared in july with st john's name in their mouths the conjecture is probable that the wild revels of st john's day a d thirteen seventy four gave rise to this mental plague which thenceforth has visited so many thousands with incurable aberration of mind and disgusting distortions of body this is rendered so much the more probable because some months previously the districts in the neighbourhood of the rhine and the mine had met with great disasters so early as february both these rivers had overflowed their banks to a great extent the walls of the town of cologne on the side next to the rhine had fallen down and a great many villages had been reduced to the utmost distress to this was added the miserable condition of western and southern germany neither law nor edict could suppress the incessant feuds of the barons and in franconia especially the ancient times of club law appeared to be revived security of property there was none arbitrary will everywhere prevailed corruption of morals and rude power rarely met with even a feeble opposition whence it arose that the cruel but lucrative persecutions of the jews were in many places still practised through the whole of this century with their wonted ferocity thus throughout the western parts of germany and especially in the districts bordering on the rhine there was a wretched and oppressed populace and if we take into consideration that among their numerous bands many wandered about whose consciences were tormented with the recollection of the crimes which they had committed during the prevalence of the black plague 
we shall comprehend how their despair sought relief in the intoxication of an artificial delirium there is hence good ground for supposing that the frantic celebration of the festival of st john anno domini 1374 only served to bring to a crisis a malady which had been long impending and if we would further inquire how a hitherto harmless usage which like many others had but served to keep up superstition could degenerate into so serious a disease we must take into account the unusual excitement of men's minds and the consequences of wretchedness and want the bowels which in many were debilitated by hunger and bad food were precisely the parts which in most cases were attacked with excruciating pain and the tympanitic state of the intestines points out to the intelligent physician an origin of the disorder which is well worth consideration End of chapter one section three chapter one section four more ancient dancing plagues the dancing mania of the year thirteen seventy four was in fact no new disease but a phenomenon well known in the middle ages of which many wondrous stories were traditionally current among the people in the year twelve thirty seven upwards of a hundred children were said to have been suddenly seized with this disease at erfurt and to have proceeded dancing and jumping along the road to arnstadt when they arrived at that place they fell exhausted to the ground and according to an account of an old chronicle many of them after they were taken home by their parents died and the rest remained affected to the end of their lives with a permanent tremor another occurrence was related to have taken place on the moselle bridge at utrecht on the seventeenth day of june a d twelve seventy eight when two hundred fanatics began to dance and would not desist until a priest passed who was carrying the host to a person that was sick upon which as if in punishment of their crime the bridge gave way and they were all drowned a similar event also occurred so early as the year ten twenty seven near the convent church of kolbich not far from bernburg according to an oft-repeated tradition eighteen peasants some of whose names are still preserved are said to have disturbed divine service on christmas eve by dancing and brawling in the churchyard whereupon the priest ruprecht inflicted a curse upon them that they should dance and scream for a whole year without ceasing this curse is stated to have been completely fulfilled so that the unfortunate sufferers at length sank knee-deep into the earth and remained the whole time without nourishment until they were finally released by the intercession of two pious bishops it is said that upon this they fell into a deep sleep which lasted three days and that four of them died the rest continuing to suffer all their lives from a trembling of their limbs it is not worth while to separate what may have been true and what the addition of crafty priests in this strangely distorted story it is sufficient that it was believed and related with astonishment and horror throughout the middle ages so that when there was any exciting cause for this delirious raving and wild rage for dancing it failed not to produce its effects upon men whose thoughts were given up to a belief in wonders and apparitions 
this disposition of mind altogether so peculiar to the middle ages and which happily for mankind has yielded to an improved state of civilization and the diffusion of popular instruction accounts for the origin and long duration of this extraordinary mental disorder the good sense of the people recoiled with horror and aversion from this heavy plague which whenever malevolent persons wished to curse their bitterest enemies and adversaries was long after used as a malediction the indignation also that was felt by the people at large against the immorality of the age was proved by their ascribing this frightful affliction to the inefficacy of baptism by unchaste priests as if innocent children were doomed to atone in after years for this desecration of the sacrament administered by unholy hands we have already mentioned what perils the priests in the netherlands incurred from this belief they now indeed endeavoured to hasten their reconciliation with the irritated and at that time very degenerate people by exorcisms which with some procured them greater respect than ever because they thus visibly restored thousands of those who were affected in general however there prevailed a want of confidence in their efficacy and then the sacred rites had as little power in arresting the progress of this deeply rooted malady as the prayers and holy services subsequently had at the altars of the greatly revered martyr saint vitus we may therefore ascribe it to accident merely and to a certain aversion to this demoniacal disease which seemed to lie beyond the reach of human skill that we meet with but few and imperfect notices of the st vitus's dance in the second half of the fifteenth century the highly coloured descriptions of the sixteenth century contradict the notion that this mental plague had in any degree diminished in its severity and not a single fact is to be found which supports the opinion that any one of the essential symptoms of the disease not even excepting the tympany had disappeared or that the disorder itself had become milder in its attacks the physicians never as it seems throughout the whole of the fifteenth century undertook the treatment of the dancing mania which according to the prevailing notions appertained exclusively to the servants of the church against demoniacal disorders they had no remedies and though some at first did promulgate the opinion that the malady had its origin in natural circumstances such as a hot temperament and other causes named in the phraseology of the schools yet these opinions were the less examined as it did not appear worth while to divide with a jealous priesthood the care of a host of fanatical vagabonds and beggars End of chapter one section four chapter one section five physicians it was not until the beginning of the sixteenth century that the st vitus's dance was made the subject of medical research and stripped of its unhallowed character as a work of demons this was effected by paracelsus that mighty but as yet scarcely comprehended reformer of medicine whose aim it was to withdraw diseases from the pale of miraculous interpositions and saintly influences and explain their causes upon principles deduced from his knowledge of the human frame we will not however admit that the saints have power to inflict diseases and that these ought to be named after them although many there are who in their theology lay great stress on this supposition 
ascribing them rather to God than to nature, which is but idle talk. We dislike such nonsensical gossip as is not supported by symptoms, but only by faith, a thing which is not human, whereon the gods themselves set no value. Such were the words which Paracelsus addressed to his contemporaries, who were as yet incapable of appreciating doctrines of this sort for the belief in enchantment still remained everywhere unshaken and faith in the world of spirits still held men's minds in so close a bondage that thousands were according to their own conviction given up as a prey to the devil while at the command of religion as well as of law countless piles were lighted by the flames of which human society was to be purified paracelsus divides the st vitus's dance into three kinds first that which arises from imagination witista corea imaginativa aestimativa by which the original dancing plague is to be understood secondly that which arises from sensual desires depending on the will corea la shiva thirdly that which arises from corporeal causes corea naturalis coacta which according to a strange notion of his own he explained by maintaining that in certain vessels which are susceptible of an internal pruriency and thence produce laughter the blood is set in commotion in consequence of an alteration in the vital spirits whereby involuntary fits of intoxicating joy and a propensity to dance are occasioned to this notion he was no doubt led from having observed a milder form of st vitus's dance not uncommon in his time which was accompanied by involuntary laughter and which bore a resemblance to the hysterical laughter of the moderns except that it was characterized by more pleasurable sensations and by an extravagant propensity to dance there was no howling screaming and jumping as in the severer form neither was the disposition to dance by any means insuperable patients thus affected although they had not a complete control over their understandings yet were sufficiently self-possessed during the attack to obey the instructions which they received there were even some among them who did not dance at all but only felt an involuntary impulse to allay the internal sense of disquietude which is the usual forerunner of an attack of this kind by laughter and quick walking carried to the extent of producing fatigue this disorder so different from the original type evidently approximates to the modern chorea or rather is in perfect accordance with it even to the less essential symptom of laughter a mitigation in the form of the dancing mania had thus clearly taken place at the commencement of the sixteenth century on the communication of the st vitus's dance by sympathy paracelsus in his peculiar language expresses himself with great spirit and shows a profound knowledge of the nature of sensual impressions which find their way to the heart the seat of joys and emotions which overpower the opposition of reason and whilst all other qualities and natures are subdued incessantly impel the patient in consequence of his original compliance and his all-conquering imagination to imitate what he has seen on his treatment of the disease we cannot bestow any great praise but must be content with the remark that it was in conformity with the notions of the age in which he lived for the first kind 
which often originated in passionate excitement he had a mental remedy the efficacy of which is not to be despised if we estimate its value in connection with the prevalent opinions of those times the patient was to make an image of himself in wax or resin and by an effort of thought to concentrate all his blasphemies and sins in it without the intervention of any other persons to set his whole mind and thoughts concerning these oaths in the image and when he had succeeded in this he was to burn the image so that not a particle of it should remain in all this there was no mention made of st vitus or of any of the other mediatory saints which is accounted for by the circumstance that at this time an open rebellion against the romish church had begun and the worship of saints was by many rejected as idolatrous for the second kind of st vitus's dance arising from sensual irritation with which women were far more frequently affected than men paracelsus recommended harsh treatment and strict fasting he directed that the patients should be deprived of their liberty placed in solitary confinement and made to sit in an uncomfortable place until their misery brought them to their senses and to a feeling of penitence he then permitted them gradually to return to their accustomed habits severe corporal chastisement was not omitted but on the other hand angry resistance on the part of the patient was to be sedulously avoided on the ground that it might increase his malady or even destroy him moreover where it seemed proper paracelsus allayed the excitement of the nerves by immersion in cold water on the treatment of the third kind we shall not here enlarge it was to be effected by all sorts of wonderful remedies composed of the quintessences and it would require to render it intelligible a more extended exposition of peculiar principles than suits our present purpose end of chapter one section five chapter one section six decline and termination of the dancing plague about this time the st vitus's dance began to decline so that milder forms of it appeared more frequently while the severer cases became more rare and even in these some of the more important symptoms gradually disappeared paracelsus makes no mention of the tympanites as taking place after the attacks although it may occasionally have occurred and schenk von grafenberg a celebrated physician of the latter half of the sixteenth century speaks of this disease as having been frequent only in the time of his forefathers his descriptions however are applicable to the whole of that century and to the close of the fifteenth the st vitus's dance attacked people of all stations especially those who led a sedentary life such as shoemakers and tailors but even the most robust peasants abandoned their labours in the fields as if they were possessed by evil spirits and thus those affected were seen assembling indiscriminately from time to time at certain appointed places and unless prevented by the lookers-on continuing to dance without intermission until their very last breath was expended their fury and extravagance of demeanour so completely deprived them of their senses that many of them dashed their brains out against the walls and corners of buildings or rushed headlong into rapid rivers where they found a watery grave roaring and foaming as they were the bystanders could only succeed in restraining them by placing benches and chairs in their way 
so that by the high leaps they were thus tempted to take their strength might be exhausted as soon as this was the case they fell as it were lifeless to the ground and by very slow degrees again recovered their strength many there were who even with all this exertion had not expended the violence of the tempest which raged within them but awoke with newly revived powers and again and again mixed with the crowd of dancers until at length the violent excitement of their disordered nerves was allayed by the great involuntary exertion of their limbs and the mental disorder was calmed by the extreme exhaustion of the body thus the attacks themselves were in these cases as in their nature they are in all nervous complaints necessary crises of an inward morbid condition which was transferred from the sensorium to the nerves of motion and at an earlier period to the abdominal plexus where a deep-seated derangement of the system was perceptible from the secretion of flatus in the intestines the cure effected by these stormy attacks was in many cases so perfect that some patients returned to the factory or the plough as if nothing had happened others on the contrary paid the penalty of their folly by so total a loss of power that they could not regain their former health even by the employment of the most strengthening remedies medical men were astonished to observe that women in an advanced state of pregnancy were capable of going through an attack of the disease without the slightest injury to their offspring which they protected merely by a bandage passed round the waist cases of this kind were not infrequent so late as schenk's time that patients should be violently affected by music and their paroxysms brought on and increased by it is natural with such nervous disorders where deeper impressions are made through the ear which is the most intellectual of all the organs than through any of the other senses on this account the magistrates hired musicians for the purpose of carrying the st vitus's dancers so much the quicker through the attacks and directed that athletic men should be sent among them in order to complete the exhaustion which had been often observed to produce a good effect at the same time there was a prohibition against wearing red garments because at the sight of this colour those affected became so furious that they flew at the persons who wore it and were so bent upon doing them an injury that they could with difficulty be restrained they frequently tore their own clothes whilst in the paroxysm and were guilty of other improprieties so that the more opulent employed confidential attendants to accompany them and to take care that they did no harm either to themselves or others this extraordinary disease was however so greatly mitigated in schenk's time that the st vitus's dancers had long ceased to stroll from town to town and that a physician like paracelsus makes no mention of the tympanitic inflation of the bowels moreover most of those affected were only annually visited by attacks and the occasion of them was so manifestly referable to the prevailing notions of that period that if the unqualified belief in the supernatural agency of saints could have been abolished they would not have had any return of the complaint throughout the whole of june prior to the festival of st john patients felt a disquietude and restlessness which they were unable to overcome they were dejected timid and anxious wandered about in an unsettled state being tormented with twitching pains which seized them suddenly in different parts and eagerly expected the eve of st john's day 
in the confident hope that by dancing at the altars of this saint or of st vitus for in the brythesgau aid was equally sought from both they would be freed from all their sufferings this hope was not disappointed and they remained for the rest of the year exempt from any further attack after having thus by dancing and raving for three hours satisfied an irresistible demand of nature there were at that period two chapels in the brysgau visited by the st vitus's dancers namely the chapel of st vitus at biesen near breisach and that of st john near wasenweiler and it is probable that in the south-west of germany the disease was still in existence in the seventeenth century however it grew every year more rare so that at the beginning of the seventeenth century it was observed only occasionally in its ancient form thus in the spring of the year sixteen twenty three g horst saw some women who annually performed a pilgrimage to st vitus's chapel at trefelhausen near weissenstein in the territory of ulm that they might wait for their dancing fit there in the same manner as those in the breisgau did according to schenk's account they were not satisfied however with a dance of three hours duration but continued day and night in a state of mental aberration like persons in an ecstasy until they fell exhausted to the ground and when they came to themselves again they felt relieved from a distressing uneasiness and painful sensation of weight in their bodies of which they had complained for several weeks prior to st vitus's day after this commotion they remained well for the whole year and such was their faith in the protecting power of the saint that one of them had visited this shrine at drefelhausen more than twenty times and another had already kept the saint's day for the thirty-second time at this sacred station the dancing fit itself was excited here as it probably was in other places by music from the effects of which the patients were thrown into a state of convulsion many concurrent testimonies serve to show that music generally contributed much to the continuance of the st vitus's dance originated and increased its paroxysms and was sometimes the cause of their mitigation so early as the fourteenth century the swarms of st john's dancers were accompanied by minstrels playing upon noisy instruments who roused their morbid feelings and it may readily be supposed that by the performance of lively melodies and the stimulating effects which the shrill tones of fifes and trumpets would produce a paroxysm that was perhaps but slight in itself might in many cases be increased to the most outrageous fury such as in later times was purposely induced in order that the force of the disease might be exhausted by the violence of its attack moreover by means of intoxicating music a kind of demoniacal festival for the rude multitude was established which had the effect of spreading this unhappy malady wider and wider soft harmony was however employed to calm the excitement of those affected and it is mentioned as a character of the tunes played with this view to the st vitus's dancers that they contained transitions from a quick to a slow measure and passed gradually from a high to a low key it is to be regretted that no trace of this music has reached our times which is owing partly to the disastrous events of the seventeenth century and partly to the circumstance that the disorder was looked upon as entirely national and only incidentally considered worthy of notice by foreign men of learning 
if the st vitus's dance was already on the decline at the commencement of the seventeenth century the subsequent events were altogether adverse to its continuance wars carried on with animosity and with various success for thirty years shook the west of europe and although the unspeakable calamities which they brought upon germany both during their continuance and in their immediate consequences were by no means favourable to the advance of knowledge yet with the vehemence of a purifying fire they gradually effected the intellectual regeneration of the germans superstition in her ancient form never again appeared and the belief in the dominion of spirits which prevailed in the middle ages lost for ever its once formidable power End of chapter one chapter two section one tarantism it was of the utmost advantage to the st vitus's dancers that they made choice of a favourite patron saint for not to mention that people were inclined to compare them to the possessed with evil spirits described in the bible and thence to consider them as innocent victims to the power of satan the name of their great intercessor recommended them to general commiseration and a magic boundary was thus set to every harsh feeling which might otherwise have proved hostile to their safety other fanatics were not so fortunate being often treated with the most relentless cruelty whenever the notions of the middle ages either excused or commanded it as a religious duty thus passing over the innumerable instances of the burning of witches who were after all only labouring under a delusion the teutonic knights in prussia not unfrequently condemned those maniacs to the stake who imagined themselves to be metamorphosed into wolves an extraordinary species of insanity which having existed in greece before our era spread in process of time over europe so that it was communicated not only to the romaic but also to the german and sarmatian nations and descended from the ancients as a legacy of affliction to posterity in modern times lycanthropy such was the name given to this infatuation has vanished from the earth but it is nevertheless well worthy the consideration of the observer of human aberrations and a history of it by some writer who is equally well acquainted with the middle ages as with antiquity is still a desideratum we leave it for the present without further notice and turn to a malady most extraordinary in all its phenomena having a close connection with the st vitus's dance and by a comparison of facts which are altogether similar affording us an instructive subject for contemplation we allude to the disease called tarantism which made its first appearance in apulia and thence spread over the other provinces of italy where during some centuries it prevailed as a great epidemic in the present times it has vanished or at least has lost altogether its original importance like the st vitus's dance lycanthropy and witchcraft End of chapter 2, section 1 Chapter 2, section 2 Most ancient traces, causes The learned Nicholas Perotti gives the earliest account of this strange disorder. Nobody had the least doubt that it was caused by the bite of the tarantula, a ground spider common in Apulia, 
and the fear of this insect was so general that its bite was in all probability much oftener imagined or the sting of some other kind of insect mistaken for it than actually received the word tarantula is apparently the same as terantula a name given by the italians to the stellio of the old romans which was a kind of lizard said to be poisonous and invested by credulity with such extraordinary qualities that like the serpent of the mosaic account of the creation it personified in the imaginations of the vulgar the notion of cunning so that even the jurists designated a cunning fraud by the appellation of a stellionatus perotti expressly assures us that this reptile was called by the romans tarantula and since he himself who was one of the most distinguished authors of his time strangely confounds spiders and lizards together so that he considers the apulian tarantula which he ranks among the class of spiders to have the same meaning as the kind of lizard called ascalabotes it is the less extraordinary that the unlearned country people of apulia should confound the much dreaded ground spider with the fabulous star lizard and appropriate to the one the name of the other the derivation of the word tarantula from the city of tarentum or the river tara in apulia on the banks of which this insect is said to have been most frequently found or at least its bite to have had the most venomous effect seems not to be supported by authority so much for the name of this famous spider which unless we are greatly mistaken throws no light whatever upon the nature of the disease in question naturalists who possessing a knowledge of the past should not misapply their talents by employing them in establishing the dry distinction of forms would find here much that calls for research and their efforts would clear up many a perplexing obscurity perotti states that the tarantula that is the spider so called was not met with in italy in former times but that in his day it had become common especially in apulia as well as in some other districts he deserves however no great confidence as a naturalist notwithstanding his having delivered lectures in bologna on medicine and other sciences he at least has neglected to prove his assertion which is not borne out by any analogous phenomenon observed in modern times with regard to the history of the spider species it is by no means to be admitted that the tarantula did not make its appearance in italy before the disease ascribed to its bite became remarkable even though tempests more violent than those unexampled storms which arose at the time of the black death in the middle of the fourteenth century had set the insect world in motion for the spider is little if at all susceptible of those cosmical influences which at times multiply locusts and other winged insects to a wonderful extent and compel them to migrate the symptoms which perotti enumerates as consequent on the bite of the tarantula agree very exactly with those described by later writers those who were bitten generally fell into a state of melancholy and appeared to be stupefied and scarcely in possession of their senses this condition was in many cases united with so great a sensibility to music that at the very first tones of their favourite melodies they sprang up shouting for joy and danced on without intermission until they sank to the ground exhausted and almost lifeless in others the disease did not take this cheerful turn they wept constantly and as if pining away with some unsatisfied desire 
spent their days in the greatest misery and anxiety others again in morbid fits of love cast their longing looks on women and instances of death are recorded which are said to have occurred under a paroxysm of either laughing or weeping from this description incomplete as it is we may easily gather that tarantism the essential symptoms of which are mentioned in it could not have originated in the fifteenth century to which perotti's account refers for that author speaks of it as a well-known malady and states that the omission to notice it by older writers was to be ascribed solely to the want of education in apulia the only province probably where the disease at that time prevailed a nervous disorder that had arrived at so high a degree of development must have been long in existence and doubtless had required an elaborate preparation by the concurrence of general causes the symptoms which followed the bite of venomous spiders were well known to the ancients and had excited the attention of their best observers who agree in their descriptions of them it is probable that among the numerous species of their phalangium the apulian tarantula is included but it is difficult to determine this point with certainty more especially because in italy the tarantula was not the only insect which caused this nervous affection similar results being likewise attributed to the bite of the scorpion lividity of the whole body as well as of the countenance difficulty of speech tremor of the limbs icy coldness pale urine depression of spirits headache a flow of tears nausea vomiting sexual excitement flatulence syncope dysuria watchfulness lethargy even death itself were cited by them as the consequences of being bitten by venomous spiders and they made little distinction as to their kinds to these symptoms we may add the strange rumour repeated throughout the middle ages that persons who were bitten ejected by the bowels and kidneys and even by vomiting substances resembling a spider's web nowhere however do we find any mention made that those affected felt an irresistible propensity to dancing or that they were accidentally cured by it even constantine of africa who lived five hundred years after aetius and as the most learned physician of the school of salerno would certainly not have passed over so acceptable a subject of remark knows nothing of such a memorable course of this disease arising from poison and merely repeats the observations of his greek predecessors gariopontus a salernian physician of the eleventh century was the first to describe a kind of insanity the remote affinity of which to the tarantula disease is rendered apparent by a very striking symptom the patients in their sudden attacks behaved like maniacs sprang up throwing their arms about with wild movements and if perchance a sword was at hand they wounded themselves and others so that it became necessary carefully to secure them they imagined that they heard voices and various kinds of sounds and if during this state of illusion the tones of a favourite instrument happened to catch their ear they commenced a spasmodic dance or ran with the utmost energy which they could muster until they were totally exhausted these dangerous maniacs who it would seem appeared in considerable numbers were looked upon as a legion of devils but on the causes of their malady this obscure writer adds nothing further than that he believes oddly enough 
that it may sometimes be excited by the bite of a mad dog he calls the disease anteneasmus by which is meant no doubt the enthusiasmus of the greek physicians we cite this phenomenon as an important forerunner of tarantism under the conviction that we have thus added to the evidence that the development of this latter must have been founded on circumstances which existed from the twelfth to the end of the fourteenth century for the origin of tarantism itself is referable with the utmost probability to a period between the middle and the end of this century and consequently contemporaneous with that of the st vitus's dance thirteen seventy four the influence of the roman catholic religion connected as this was in the middle ages with the pomp of processions with public exercises of penance and with innumerable practices which strongly excited the imaginations of its votaries certainly brought the mind to a very favourable state for the reception of a nervous disorder accordingly so long as the doctrines of christianity were blended with so much mysticism these unhallowed disorders prevailed to an important extent and even in our own days we find them propagated with the greatest facility where the existence of superstition produces the same effect in more limited districts as it once did among whole nations but this is not all every country in europe and italy perhaps more than any other was visited during the middle ages by frightful plagues which followed each other in such quick succession that they gave the exhausted people scarcely any time for recovery the oriental bubo plague ravaged italy sixteen times between the years eleven nineteen and thirteen forty smallpox and measles were still more destructive than in modern times and recurred as frequently st anthony's fire was the dread of town and country and that disgusting disease the leprosy which in consequence of the crusades spread its insinuating poison in all directions snatched from the paternal hearth innumerable victims who banished from human society pined away in lonely huts whither they were accompanied only by the pity of the benevolent and their own despair all these calamities of which the moderns have scarcely retained any recollection were heightened to an incredible degree by the black death which spread boundless devastation and misery over italy men's minds were everywhere morbidly sensitive and as it happened with individuals whose senses when they are suffering under anxiety become more irritable so that trifles are magnified into objects of great alarm and slight shocks which would scarcely affect the spirits when in health gave rise in them to severe diseases so was it with this whole nation at all times so alive to emotions and at that period so sorely oppressed with the horrors of death the bite of venomous spiders or rather the unreasonable fear of its consequences excited at such a juncture though it could not have done so at an earlier period a violent nervous disorder which like st vitus's dance in germany spread by sympathy increasing in severity as it took a wider range and still further extending its ravages from its long continuance thus from the middle of the fourteenth century the furies of the dance brandished their scourge over afflicted mortals and music for which the inhabitants of italy now probably for the first time manifested susceptibility and talent became capable of exciting ecstatic attacks in those affected 
and then furnished the magical means of exercising their melancholy end of chapter two section two chapter two section three increase at the close of the fifteenth century we find that tarantism had spread beyond the boundaries of apulia and that the fear of being bitten by venomous spiders had increased nothing short of death itself was expected from the wound which these insects inflicted and if those who were bitten escaped with their lives they were said to be seen pining away in a desponding state of lassitude many became weak-sighted or hard of hearing some lost the power of speech and all were insensible to ordinary causes of excitement nothing but the flute or the scythern afforded them relief at the sound of these instruments they awoke as it were by enchantment opened their eyes and moving slowly at first according to the measure of the music where as the time quickened gradually hurried on to the most passionate dance it was generally observable that country people who were rude and ignorant of music evinced on these occasions an unusual degree of grace as if they had been well practised in elegant movements of the body for it is a peculiarity in nervous disorders of this kind that the organs of motion are in an altered condition and are completely under the control of the overstrained spirits cities and villages alike resounded throughout the summer season with the notes of fifes clarinets and turkish drums and patients were everywhere to be met with who looked to dancing as their only remedy alexander ab alexandro who gives this account saw a young man in a remote village who was seized with a violent attack of tarantism he listened with eagerness and a fixed stare to the sound of a drum and his graceful movements gradually became more and more violent until his dancing was converted into a succession of frantic leaps which required the utmost exertion of his whole strength in the midst of this overstrained exertion of mind and body the music suddenly ceased and he immediately fell powerless to the ground where he lay senseless and motionless until its magical effect again aroused him to a renewal of his impassioned performances at the period of which we are treating there was a general conviction that by music and dancing the poison of the tarantula was distributed over the whole body and expelled through the skin but that if there remained the slightest vestige of it in the vessels this became a permanent germ of the disorder so that the dancing fits might again and again be excited ad infinitum by music this belief which resembled the delusion of those insane persons who being by artful management freed from the imagined causes of their sufferings are but for a short time released from their false notions was attended with the most injurious effects for in consequence of it those affected necessarily became by degrees convinced of the incurable nature of their disorder they expected relief indeed but not a cure from music and when the heat of summer awakened a recollection of the dances of the preceding year they like the st vitus's dancers of the same period before st vitus's day again grew dejected and misanthropic until by music and dancing they dispelled the melancholy which had become with them a kind of sensual enjoyment under such favourable circumstances it is clear that tarantism must every year have made further progress 
the number of those affected by it increased beyond all belief for whoever had either actually been or even fancied that he had been once bitten by a poisonous spider or scorpion made his appearance annually wherever the merry notes of the tarantella resounded inquisitive females joined the throng and caught the disease not indeed from the poison of the spider but from the mental poison which they eagerly received through the eye and thus the cure of the tarantati gradually became established as a regular festival of the populace which was anticipated with impatient delight without attributing more to deception and fraud than to the peculiar nature of a progressive mental malady it may readily be conceived that the cases of this strange disorder now grew more frequent the celebrated mattioli who is worthy of entire confidence gives his account as an eye-witness he saw the same extraordinary effects produced by music as alexandro for however tortured with pain however hopeless of relief the patients appeared as they lay stretched on the couch of sickness at the very first sounds of those melodies which made an impression on them but this was the case only with the tarantellas composed expressly for the purpose they sprang up as if inspired with new life and spirit and unmindful of their disorder began to move in measured gestures dancing for hours together without fatigue until covered with a kindly perspiration they felt a salutary degree of lassitude which relieved them for a time at least perhaps even for a whole year from their defection and oppressive feeling of general indisposition alexandro's experience of the injurious effects resulting from a sudden cessation of the music was generally confirmed by mattioli if the clarinets and drums ceased for a single moment which as the most skilful players were tired out by the patients could not but happen occasionally they suffered their limbs to fall listless again sank exhausted to the ground and could find no solace but in a renewal of the dance on this account care was taken to continue the music until exhaustion was produced for it was better to pay a few extra musicians who might relieve each other than to permit the patient in the midst of this curative exercise to relapse into so deplorable a state of suffering the attack consequent upon the bite of the tarantula mattioli describes as varying much in its manner some became morbidly exhilarated so that they remained for a long while without sleep laughing dancing and singing in a state of the greatest excitement others on the contrary were drowsy the generality felt nausea and suffered from vomiting and some had constant tremors complete mania was no uncommon occurrence not to mention the usual dejection of spirits and other subordinate symptoms End of chapter two section three chapter two section four idiosyncrasies music unaccountable emotions strange desires and morbid sensual irritations of all kinds were as prevalent as in the st vitus's dance and similar great nervous maladies so late as the sixteenth century patients were seen armed with glittering swords which during the attack they brandished with wild gestures as if they were going to engage in a fencing match even women scorned all female delicacy and adopting this impassioned demeanour did the same 
and this phenomenon as well as the excitement which the tarantula dancers felt at the sight of anything with metallic lustre was quite common up to the period when in modern times the disease disappeared the abhorrence of certain colours and the agreeable sensations produced by others were much more marked among the excitable italians than was the case in the st vitus's dance with the more phlegmatic germans red colours which the st vitus's dancers detested they generally liked so that a patient was seldom seen who did not carry a red handkerchief for his gratification or greedily feast his eyes on any articles of red clothing worn by the bystanders some preferred yellow others black colours of which an explanation was sought according to the prevailing notions of the times in the difference of temperaments Others again were enraptured with green, and eyewitnesses describe this rage for colours as so extraordinary that they can scarcely find words with which to express their astonishment. No sooner did the patients obtain a sight of the favourite colour than, new as the impression was, they rushed like infuriated animals towards the object, devoured it with their eager looks, kissed and caressed it in every possible way and gradually resigning themselves to softer sensations adopted the languishing expression of enamoured lovers and embraced the handkerchief or whatever other article it might be which was presented to them with the most intense ardour while the tears streamed from their eyes as if they were completely overwhelmed by the inebriating impression on their senses the dancing fits of a certain capuchin friar in tarentum excited so much curiosity that cardinal cayetano proceeded to the monastery that he might see with his own eyes what was going on as soon as the monk who was in the midst of his dance perceived the spiritual prince clothed in his red garments he no longer listened to the tarantella of the musicians but with strange gestures endeavoured to approach the cardinal as if he wished to count the very threads of his scarlet robe and to allay his intense longing by its odour the interference of the spectators and his own respect prevented his touching it and thus the irritation of his senses not being appeased he fell into a state of such anguish and disquietude that he presently sank down in a swoon from which he did not recover until the cardinal compassionately gave him his cape this he immediately seized in the greatest ecstasy and pressed now to his breast now to his forehead and cheeks and then again commenced his dance as if in the frenzy of a love fit at the sight of colours which they disliked patients flew into the most violent rage and like the st vitus's dancers when they saw red objects could scarcely be restrained from tearing the clothes of those spectators who raised in them such disagreeable sensations another no less extraordinary symptom was the ardent longing for the sea which the patients evinced as the st john's dancers of the fourteenth century saw in the spirit the heavens open and display all the splendour of the saints so did those who were suffering under the bite of the tarantula feel themselves attracted to the boundless expanse of the blue ocean and lost themselves in its contemplation some songs which are still preserved mark this peculiar longing which was moreover expressed by significant music and was excited even by the bare mention of the sea some in whom this susceptibility was carried to the greatest pitch cast themselves with blind fury into the blue waves 
as the st vitus's dancers occasionally did into rapid rivers this condition so opposite to the frightful state of hydrophobia betrayed itself in others only in the pleasure afforded to them by the sight of clear water in glasses these they bore in their hands while dancing exhibiting at the same time strange movements and giving way to the most extravagant expressions of their feeling they were delighted also when in the midst of the space allotted for this exercise more ample vessels filled with water and surrounded by rushes and water plants were placed in which they bathed their heads and arms with evident pleasure others there were who rolled about on the ground and were by their own desire buried up to the neck in the earth in order to alleviate the misery of their condition not to mention an endless variety of other symptoms which showed the perverted action of the nerves all these modes of relief however were as nothing in comparison with the irresistible charms of musical sound attempts had indeed been made in ancient times to mitigate the pain of sciatica or the paroxysms of mania by the soft melody of the flute and what is still more applicable to the present purpose to remove the danger arising from the bite of vipers by the same means this however was tried only to a very small extent but after being bitten by the tarantula there was according to popular opinion no way of saving life except by music and it was hardly considered as an exception to the general rule that every now and then the bad effects of a wound were prevented by placing a ligature on the bitten limb or by internal medicine or that strong persons occasionally withstood the effects of the poison without the employment of any remedies at all it was much more common and is quite in accordance with the nature of so exquisite a nervous disease to hear accounts of many who when bitten by the tarantula perished miserably because the tarantella which would have afforded them deliverance was not played to them it was customary therefore so early as the commencement of the seventeenth century for whole bands of musicians to traverse italy during the summer months and what is quite unexampled either in ancient or modern times the cure of the tarantati in the different towns and villages was undertaken on a grand scale this season of dancing and music was called the women's little carnival for it was women more especially who conducted the arrangements so that throughout the whole country they saved up their spare money for the purpose of rewarding the welcome musicians and many of them neglected their household employments to participate in this festival of the sick mention is even made of one benevolent lady mita lupa who had expended her whole fortune on this object the music itself was of a kind perfectly adapted to the nature of the malady and it made so deep an impression on the italians that even to the present time long since the extinction of the disorder they have retained the tarantella as a particular species of music employed for quick lively dancing the different kinds of tarantella were distinguished very significantly by particular names which had reference to the moods observed in the patients whence it appears that they aimed at representing by these tunes even the idiosyncrasies of the mind as expressed in the countenance thus there was one kind of tarantella which was called panno rosso a very lively impassioned style of music to which wild dithyrambic songs were adapted another called panno verde which was suited to the milder excitement of the senses caused by green colours 
and set to idyllian songs of verdant fields and shady groves a third was named cinque tempi a fourth moresca which was played to a moorish dance a fifth catena and a sixth with a very appropriate designation sballata as if it were only fit to be played to dancers who were lame in the shoulder this was the slowest and least in vogue of all for those who loved water they took care to select love songs which were sung to corresponding music and such persons delighted in hearing of gushing springs and rushing cascades and streams it is to be regretted that on this subject we are unable to give any further information for only small fragments of songs and a very few tarantellas have been preserved which belong to a period so remote as the beginning of the seventeenth or at furthest the end of the sixteenth century the music was almost wholly in the turkish style aria turkesca and the ancient songs of the peasantry of apulia which increased in number annually were well suited to the abrupt and lively notes of the turkish drum and the shepherd's pipe these two instruments were the favourites in the country but others of all kinds were played in towns and villages as an accompaniment to the dances of the patients and the songs of the spectators if any particular melody was disliked by those affected they indicated their displeasure by violent gestures expressive of aversion they could not endure false notes and it is remarkable that uneducated boors who had never in their lives manifested any perception of the enchanting power of harmony acquired in this respect an extremely refined sense of hearing as if they had been initiated into the profoundest secrets of the musical art it was a matter of every day's experience that patients showed a predilection for certain tarantellas in preference to others which gave rise to the composition of a great variety of these dances they were likewise very capricious in their partialities for particular instruments so that some longed for the shrill notes of the trumpet others for the softest music produced by the vibration of strings tarantism was at its greatest height in italy in the seventeenth century long after the st vitus's dance of germany had disappeared it was not the natives of the country only who were attacked by this complaint foreigners of every colour and of every race negroes gypsies spaniards albanians were in like manner affected by it against the effects produced by the tarantula's bite or by the sight of the sufferers neither youth nor age afforded any protection so that even old men of ninety threw aside their crutches at the sound of the tarantella and as if some magic potion restorative of youth and vigour were flowing through their veins joined the most extravagant dancers ferdinando saw a boy five years old seized with the dancing mania in consequence of the bite of a tarantula and what is almost past belief were it not supported by the testimony of so credible an eye-witness even deaf people were not exempt from this disorder so potent in its effect was the very sight of those affected even without the exhilarating emotions caused by music subordinate nervous attacks were much more frequent during this century than at any former period and an extraordinary icy coldness was observed in those who were the subject of them so that they did not recover their natural heat until they had engaged in violent dancing their anguish and sense of oppression forced from them a cold perspiration 
the secretion from the kidneys was pale and they had so great a dislike to everything cold that when water was offered them they pushed it away with abhorrence wine on the contrary they all drank willingly without being heated by it or in the slightest degree intoxicated during the whole period of the attack they suffered from spasms in the stomach and felt a disinclination to take food of any kind they used to abstain some time before the expected seizures from meat and from snails which they thought rendered them more severe and their great thirst for wine may therefore in some measure be attributable to the want of a more nutritious diet yet the disorder of the nerves was evidently its chief cause and the loss of appetite as well as the necessity for support by wine were its effects loss of voice occasional blindness vertigo complete insanity with sleeplessness frequent weeping without any ostensible cause were all usual symptoms many patients found relief from being placed in swings or rocked in cradles others required to be roused from their state of suffering by severe blows on the soles of their feet others beat themselves without any intention of making a display but solely for the purpose of allaying the intense nervous irritation which they felt and a considerable number were seen with their bellies swollen like those of the st john's dancers while the violence of their intestinal disorder was indicated in others by obstinate constipation or diarrhoea and vomiting these pitiable objects gradually lost their strength and their colour and creeping about with injected eyes jaundiced complexions and inflated bowels soon fell into a state of profound melancholy which found food and solace in the solemn tolling of the funeral bell and in an abode among the tombs of cemeteries as is related of the lycanthropes of former times the persuasion of the inevitable consequences of being bitten by the tarantula exercised a dominion over men's minds which even the healthiest and strongest could not shake off so late as the middle of the sixteenth century the celebrated fra castoro found the robust bailiff of his landed estate groaning and with the aspect of a person in the extremity of despair suffering the very agonies of death from a sting in the neck inflicted by an insect which was believed to be a tarantula he kindly administered without delay a potion of vinegar and armenian bowl the great remedy of those days for the plague of all kinds of animal poisons and the dying man was as if by a miracle restored to life and the power of speech now since it is quite out of the question that the bowl could have anything to do with the result in this case notwithstanding fra castoro's belief in its virtues we can only account for the cure by supposing that a confidence in so great a physician prevailed over this fatal disease of the imagination which would otherwise have yielded to scarcely any other remedy except the tarantella ferdinando was acquainted with women who for thirty years in succession had overcome the attacks of this disorder by a renewal of their annual dance so long did they maintain their belief in the yet undestroyed poison of the tarantula's bite and so long did that mental affection continue to exist after it had ceased to depend on any corporeal excitement wherever we turn we find that this morbid state of mind prevailed and was so supported by the opinions of the age that it needed only a stimulus in the bite of the tarantula and the supposed certainty of its very disastrous consequences 
to originate this violent nervous disorder even in ferdinando's time there were many who altogether denied the poisonous effects of the tarantula's bite whilst they considered the disorder which annually set italy in commotion to be a melancholy depending on the imagination they dearly expiated this scepticism however when they were led with an inconsiderate hardihood to test their opinions by experiment for many of them became the subjects of severe tarantism and even a distinguished prelate john baptist quinzato bishop of foligno having allowed himself by way of a joke to be bitten by a tarantula could obtain a cure in no other way than by being through the influence of the tarantella compelled to dance others among the clergy who wished to shut their ears against music because they considered dancing derogatory to their station fell into a dangerous state of illness by thus delaying the crisis of the malady and were obliged at last to save themselves from a miserable death by submitting to the unwelcome but sole means of cure thus it appears that the age was so little favourable to freedom of thought that even the most decided sceptics incapable of guarding themselves against the recollection of what had been presented to the eye were subdued by a poison the powers of which they had ridiculed and which was in itself inert in its effect End of chapter two section four chapter two section five hysteria different characteristics of the morbidly excited vitality having been rendered prominent by tarantism in different individuals it could not but happen that other derangements of the nerves would assume the form of this whenever circumstances favoured such a transition this was more especially the case with hysteria that proteiform and mutable disorder in which the imaginations the superstitions and the follies of all ages have been evidently reflected the carnevaletto delle donne appeared most opportunely for those who were hysterical their disease received from it as it had at other times from other extraordinary customs a peculiar direction so that whether bitten by the tarantula or not they felt compelled to participate in the dances of those affected and to make their appearance at this popular festival where they had an opportunity of triumphantly exhibiting their sufferings let us here pause to consider the kind of life which the women in italy led lonely and deprived by cruel custom of social intercourse that fairest of all enjoyments they dragged on a miserable existence cheerfulness and an inclination to sensual pleasures passed into compulsory idleness and in many into black despondency their imaginations became disordered a pallid countenance and oppressed respiration bore testimony to their profound sufferings how could they do otherwise sunk as they were in such extreme misery than seize the occasion to burst forth from their prisons and alleviate their miseries by taking part in the delights of music nor should we here pass unnoticed a circumstance which illustrates in a remarkable degree the psychological nature of hysterical sufferings namely that many chlorotic females by joining the dancers at the carnevaletto were freed from their spasms and oppression of breathing for the whole year although the corporeal cause of their malady was not removed after such a result no one could call their self-deception a mere imposture 
and unconditionally condemn it as such this numerous class of patients certainly contributed not a little to the maintenance of the evil for their fantastic sufferings in which dissimulation and reality could scarcely be distinguished even by themselves much less by their physicians were imitated in the same way as the distortions of the st vitus's dancers by the impostors of that period it was certainly by these persons also that the number of subordinate symptoms was increased to an endless extent as may be conceived from the daily observation of hysterical patients who from a morbid desire to render themselves remarkable deviate from the laws of moral propriety powerful sexual excitement had often the most decided influence over their condition many of them exposed themselves in the most indecent manner tore out their hair by the roots with howling and gnashing of their teeth and when as was sometimes the case their unsatisfied passion hurried them on to a state of frenzy they closed their existence by self-destruction it being common at that time for these unfortunate beings to precipitate themselves into the wells it might hence seem that owing to the conduct of patients of this description so much of fraud and falsehood would be mixed up with the original disorder that having passed into another complaint it must have been itself destroyed this however did not happen in the first half of the seventeenth century for as a clear proof that tarantism remained substantially the same and quite unaffected by hysteria there were in many places and in particular at messapia fewer women affected than men who in their turn were in no small proportion led into temptation by sexual excitement in other places as for example at brindisi the case was reversed which may as in other complaints be in some measure attributable to local causes upon the whole it appears from concurrent accounts that women by no means enjoyed the distinction of being attacked by tarantism more frequently than men it is said that the cicatrix of the tarantula bite on the yearly or half yearly return of the fit became discoloured but on this point the distinct testimony of good observers is wanting to deprive the assertion of its utter improbability it is not out of place to remark here that about the same time that tarantism attained its greatest height in italy the bite of venomous spiders was more feared in distant parts of asia likewise than it had ever been within the memory of man there was this difference however that the symptoms supervening on the occurrence of this accident were not accompanied by the apulian nervous disorder which as has been shown in the foregoing pages had its origin rather in the melancholic temperament of the inhabitants of the south of italy than in the nature of the tarantula poison itself this poison is therefore doubtless to be considered only as a remote cause of the complaint which but for that temperament would be inadequate to its production the persians employed a very rough means of counteracting the bad consequences of a poison of this sort they drenched the wounded person with milk and then by a violent rotatory motion in a suspended box compelled him to vomit end of chapter two section five chapter two section six decrease the dancing mania arising from the tarantula bite continued with all those additions of self-deception and of the dissimulation which is such a constant attendant on nervous disorders of this kind through the whole course of the seventeenth century it was indeed gradually on the decline 
but up to the termination of this period showed such extraordinary symptoms that Balievi, one of the best physicians of that time, thought he did a service to science by making them the subject of a dissertation. He repeats all the observations of Ferdinando, and supports his own assertions by the experience of his father, a physician at Lecce, whose testimony, as an eye-witness, may be admitted as unexceptionable. The immediate consequences of the tarantula bite, the supervening nervous disorder, and the aberrations and fits of those who suffered from hysteria, he describes in a masterly style, nor does he ever suffer his credulity to diminish the authenticity of his account, of which he has been unjustly accused by later writers. Finally, tarantism has declined more and more in modern times, and is now limited to single cases. How could it possibly have maintained itself unchanged in the eighteenth century, when all the links which connected it with the Middle Ages had long since been snapped asunder? Imposture grew more frequent, and wherever the disease still appeared in its genuine form, its chief cause, namely a peculiar cast of melancholy, which formerly had been the temperament of thousands, was now possessed only occasionally by unfortunate individuals. It might therefore not unreasonably be maintained that the tarantism of modern times bears nearly the same relation to the original malady as the St. Vitus's dance, which still exists and certainly has all along existed, bears in certain cases to the original dancing mania of the dancers of St. John. To conclude, tarantism as a real disease has been denied in toto and stigmatized as an imposition by most physicians and naturalists who in this controversy have shown the narrowness of their views and their utter ignorance of history in order to support their opinion they have instituted some experiments apparently favorable to it but under circumstances altogether inapplicable, since for the most part they selected as the subjects of them none but healthy men, who were totally uninfluenced by a belief in this once so dreaded disease. From individual instances of fraud and dissimulation, such as are found in connection with most nervous affections, without rendering their reality a matter of any doubt, they drew a too hasty conclusion respecting the general phenomenon, of which they appeared not to know that it had continued for nearly four hundred years, having originated in the remotest periods of the Middle Ages. The most learned and the most acute among these sceptics is Serrao the Neapolitan his reasonings amount to this that he considers the disease to be a very marked form of melancholia and compares the effect of the tarantula bite upon it to stimulating with spurs a horse which is already running the reality of that effect he thus admits and therefore directly confirms what in appearance only he denies by shaking the already vacillating belief in this disorder, he is said to have actually succeeded in rendering it less frequent, and in setting bounds to imposture. But this no more disproves the reality of its existence than the oft-repeated detection of imposition has been able in modern times to banish magnetic sleep from the circle of natural phenomena though such detection has on its side rendered more rare the incontestable effects of animal magnetism other physicians and naturalists have delivered their sentiments on tarantism but as they have not possessed an enlarged knowledge of its history their views do not merit particular exposition 
it is sufficient for the comprehension of every one that we have presented the facts free from all extraneous speculation end of chapter two chapter three the dancing mania in abyssinia Tigretier. both the st vitus's dance and tarantism belonged to the ages in which they appeared they could not have existed under the same latitude at any other epoch for at no other period were the circumstances which prepared the way for them combined in a similar relation to each other and the mental as well as corporeal temperaments of nations which depend on causes such as have been stated are as little capable of renewal as the different stages of life in individuals this gives so much the more importance to a disease but cursorily alluded to in the foregoing pages which exists in abyssinia and which nearly resembles the original mania of the st john's dancers inasmuch as it exhibits a perfectly similar ecstasy with the same violent effect on the nerves of motion it occurs most frequently in the tigre country being thence called tigretier and is probably the same malady which is called in ethiopian language astaragaza on this subject we will introduce the testimony of nathaniel pierce an eye-witness who resided nine years in abyssinia the tigretier says he is more common among the women than among the men it seizes the body as if with a violent fever and from that turns to a lingering sickness which reduces the patients to skeletons and often kills them if the relations cannot procure the proper remedy during this sickness their speech is changed to a kind of stuttering which no one can understand but those afflicted with the same disorder when the relations find the malady to be the real tigretier they join together to defray the expense of curing it the first remedy they in general attempt is to procure the assistance of a learned doctor who reads the gospel of st john and drenches the patient with cold water daily for the space of seven days an application that very often proves fatal the most effectual cure though far more expensive than the former is as follows the relations hire for a certain sum of money a band of trumpeters drummers and fifers and buy a quantity of liquor then all the young men and women of the place assemble at the patient's house to perform the following most extraordinary ceremony i was once called in by a neighbour to see his wife a very young woman who had the misfortune to be afflicted with this disorder and the man being an old acquaintance of mine and always a close comrade in the camp i went every day when at home to see her but i could not be of any service to her though she never refused my medicines at this time i could not understand a word she said although she talked very freely nor could any of her relations understand her she could not bear the sight of a book or a priest for at the sight of either she struggled and was apparently seized with acute agony and a flood of tears like blood mingled with water would pour down her face from her eyes she had lain three months in this lingering state living upon so little that it seemed not enough to keep a human body alive at last her husband agreed to employ the usual remedy and after preparing for the maintenance of the band during the time it would take to effect the cure he borrowed from all his neighbours their silver ornaments and loaded her legs arms and neck with them 
the evening that the band began to play i seated myself close by her side as she lay upon the couch and about two minutes after the trumpets had begun to sound i observed her shoulders begin to move and soon afterwards her head and breast and in less than a quarter of an hour she sat upon her couch the wild look she had though sometimes she smiled made me draw off to a greater distance being almost alarmed to see one so nearly a skeleton move with such strength her head neck shoulders hands and feet all made a strong motion to the sound of the music and in this manner she went on by degrees until she stood up on her legs upon the floor afterwards she began to dance and at times to jump about and at last as the music and noise of the singers increased she often sprang three feet from the ground when the music slackened she would appear quite out of temper but when it became louder she would smile and be delighted during this exercise she never showed the least symptom of being tired though the musicians were thoroughly exhausted and when they stopped to refresh themselves by drinking and resting a little she would discover signs of discontent next day according to the custom in the cure of this disorder she was taken into the market-place where several jars of maize or tsuk were set in order by the relations to give drink to the musicians and dancers when the crowd had assembled and the music was ready she was brought forth and began to dance and throw herself into the maddest postures imaginable and in this manner she kept on the whole day towards evening she began to let fall her silver ornaments from her neck arms and legs one at a time so that in the course of three hours she was stripped of every article a relation continually kept going after her as she danced to pick up the ornaments and afterwards delivered them to the owners from whom they were borrowed as the sun went down she made a start with such swiftness that the fastest runner could not come up with her when at the distance of about two hundred yards she dropped on a sudden as if shot soon afterwards a young man on coming up with her fired a matchlock over her body and struck her upon the back with the broad side of his large knife and asked her name to which she answered as when in her common senses a sure proof of her being cured for during the time of this malady those afflicted with it never answer to their christian names she was now taken up in a very weak condition and carried home and a priest came and baptized her again in the name of the father son and holy ghost which ceremony concluded her cure some are taken in this manner to the market-place for many days before they can be cured and it sometimes happens that they cannot be cured at all i have seen them in these fits dance with a brulee or bottle of maize upon their heads without spilling the liquor or letting the bottle fall although they have put themselves into the most extravagant postures i could not have ventured to write this from hearsay nor could i conceive it possible until i was obliged to put this remedy in practice upon my own wife who was seized with the same disorder and then i was compelled to have a still nearer view of this strange disorder i at first thought that a whip would be of some service and one day attempted a few strokes when unnoticed by any person we being by ourselves and i having a strong suspicion that this ailment sprang from the weak minds of women 
who were encouraged in it for the sake of the grandeur rich dress and music which accompany the cure but how much was i surprised the moment i struck a light blow thinking to do good to find that she became like a corpse and even the joints of her fingers became so stiff that i could not straighten them indeed i really thought that she was dead and immediately made it known to the people in the house that she had fainted but did not tell them the cause upon which they immediately brought music which i had for many days denied them and which soon revived her and i then left the house to her relations to cure her at my expense in the manner i have before mentioned though it took a much longer time to cure my wife than the woman i have just given an account of one day i went privately with a companion to see my wife dance and kept at a short distance as i was ashamed to go near the crowd on looking steadfastly upon her while dancing or jumping more like a deer than a human being i said that it certainly was not my wife at which my companion burst into a fit of laughter from which he could scarcely refrain all the way home men are sometimes afflicted with this dreadful disorder but not frequently among the amhara and galla it is not so common such is the account of pierce who is every way worthy of credit and whose lively description renders the traditions of former times respecting the st vitus's dance and tarantism intelligible even to those who are sceptical respecting the existence of a morbid state of the mind and body of the kind described because in the present advanced state of civilization among the nations of europe opportunities for its development no longer occur the credibility of this energetic but by no means ambitious man is not liable to the slightest suspicion for owing to his want of education he had no knowledge of the phenomena in question and his work evinces throughout his attractive and unpretending impartiality comparison is the mother of observation and may here elucidate one phenomenon by another the past by that which still exists oppression insecurity and the influence of a very rude priestcraft are the powerful causes which operated on the germans and italians of the middle ages as they now continue to operate on the abyssinians of the present day however these people may differ from us in their descent their manners and their customs the effect of the above-mentioned causes are the same in africa as they were in europe for they operate on man himself independently of the particular locality in which he may be planted and the conditions of the abyssinians of modern times is in regard to superstition a mirror of the condition of the european nations of the middle ages should this appear a bold assertion it will be strengthened by the fact that in abyssinia two examples of superstitions occur which are completely in accordance with occurrences of the middle ages that took place contemporarily with the dancing mania the abyssinians have their christian flagellants and there exists among them a belief in a zoomorphism which presents a lively image of the lycanthropy of the middle ages their flagellants are called zacharies they are united into a separate christian fraternity and make their processions through the towns and villages with great noise and tumult scourging themselves till they draw blood and wounding themselves with knives they boast that they are descendants of st george 
it is precisely in tigre the country of the abyssinian dancing mania where they are found in the greatest numbers and where they have in the neighbourhood of axum a church of their own dedicated to their patron saint un arvel here there is an ever-burning lamp and they contrive to impress a belief that it is kept alight by supernatural means they also here keep a holy water which is said to be a cure for those who are affected by the dancing mania the abyssinian zoomorphism is a no less important phenomenon and shows itself in a manner quite peculiar the blacksmiths and potters form among the abyssinians a society or caste called in tigre tebib and in amhara buddha which is held in some degree of contempt and excluded from the sacrament of the lord's supper because it is believed that they can change themselves into hyenas and other beasts of prey on which account they are feared by everybody and regarded with horror they artfully contrive to keep up this superstition because by this separation they preserve a monopoly of their lucrative trades and as in other respects they are good christians but few jews or mohammedans live among them they seem to attach no great consequence to their excommunication as a badge of distinction they wear a golden earring which is frequently found in the ears of hyenas that are killed without its ever having been discovered how they catch these animals so as to decorate them with this strange ornament and this removes in the minds of the people all doubt as to the supernatural powers of the smiths and potters to the buddhas is also ascribed the gift of enchantment especially that of the influence of the evil eye they nevertheless live unmolested and are not condemned to the flames by fanatical priests as the lycanthropes were in the middle ages end of chapter three chapter four sympathy section one imitation compassion sympathy these are the imperfect designations for a common bond of union among human beings for an instinct which connects individuals with the general body which embraces with equal force reason and folly good and evil and diminishes the praise of virtue as well as the criminality of vice in this impulse there are degrees but no essential differences from the first intellectual efforts of the infant mind which are in a great measure based on imitation to that morbid condition of the soul in which the sensible impression of a nervous malady fetters the mind and finds its way through the eye directly to the diseased texture as the electric shock is propagated by contact from body to body to this instinct of imitation when it exists in its highest degree is united a loss of all power over the will which occurs as soon as the impression on the senses has become firmly established producing a condition like that of small animals when they are fascinated by the look of a serpent by this mental bondage morbid sympathy is clearly and definitely distinguished from all subordinate degrees of this instinct however closely allied the imitation of a disorder may seem to be to that of a mere folly of an absurd fashion of an awkward habit in speech and manner or even of a confusion of ideas even these latter imitations however directed as they are to foolish and pernicious objects place the self-independence of the greater portion of mankind in a very doubtful light 
and account for their union into a social whole still more nearly allied to morbid sympathy than the imitation of enticing folly although often with a considerable admixture of the latter is the diffusion of violent excitements especially those of a religious or political character which have so powerfully agitated the nations of ancient and modern times and which may after an incipient compliance pass into a total loss of power over the will and an actual disease of the mind far be it from us to attempt to awaken all the various tones of this chord whose vibrations reveal the profound secrets which lie hid in the inmost recesses of the soul we might well want powers adequate to so vast an undertaking our business here is only with that morbid sympathy by the aid of which the dancing mania of the middle ages grew into a real epidemic in order to make this apparent by comparison it may not be out of place at the close of this inquiry to introduce a few striking examples one at a cotton manufactory at hodden bridge in lancashire a girl on the fifteenth of february seventeen hundred and eighty seven put a mouse into the bosom of another girl who had a great dread of mice the girl was immediately thrown into a fit and continued in it with the most violent convulsions for twenty-four hours on the following day three more girls were seized in the same manner and on the seventeenth six more by this time the alarm was so great that the whole work in which two hundred or three hundred were employed was totally stopped and an idea prevailed that a particular disease had been introduced by a bag of cotton opened in the house on sunday the eighteenth dr st clair was sent for from preston before he arrived three more were seized and during that night and the morning of the nineteenth eleven more making in all twenty-four of these twenty-one were young women while two were girls of about ten years of age and one man who had been much fatigued with holding the girls three of the number lived about two miles from the place where the disorder first broke out and three at another factory at clitheroe about five miles distant which last and two more were infected entirely from report not having seen the other patients but like them and the rest of the country strongly impressed with the idea of the plague being caught from the cotton the symptoms were anxiety strangulation and very strong convulsions and these were so violent as to last without any intermission from a quarter of an hour to twenty-four hours and to require four or five persons to prevent the patients from tearing their hair and dashing their heads against the floor or walls dr st clair had taken with him a portable electric machine and by electric shocks the patients were universally relieved without exception as soon as the patients and the country were assured that the complaint was merely nervous easily cured and not introduced by the cotton no fresh person was affected to dissipate their apprehensions still further the best effects were obtained by causing them to take a cheerful glass and join in a dance on tuesday the twentieth they danced and the next day were all at work except two or three who were much weakened by their fits the occurrence here described is remarkable on this account that there was no important predisposing cause for convulsions in these young women unless we consider as such their miserable and confined life in the workrooms of a spinning manufactory it did not arise from enthusiasm 
nor is it stated that the patients had been the subject of any other nervous disorders in another perfectly analogous case those attacked were all suffering from nervous complaints which roused a morbid sympathy in them at the sight of a person seized with convulsions this together with the supervention of hysterical fits may aptly enough be compared to tarantism example two a young woman of the lowest order twenty-one years of age and of a strong frame came on the thirteenth of january eighteen ought one to visit a patient in the charite hospital at berlin where she had herself been previously under treatment for an inflammation of the chest with tetanic spasms and immediately on entering the ward fell down in strong convulsions at the sight of her violent contortions six other female patients immediately became affected in the same way and by degrees eight more were in like manner attacked with strong convulsions all these patients were from sixteen to twenty-five years of age and suffered without exception one from spasms in the stomach another from palsy a third from lethargy a fourth from fits with consciousness a fifth from catalepsy a sixth from syncope etc the convulsions which alternated in various ways with tonic spasms were accompanied by loss of sensibility and were invariably preceded by languor with heavy sleep which was followed by the fits in the course of a minute or two and it is remarkable that in all these patients their former nervous disorders not excepting paralysis disappeared returning however after the subsequent removal of their new complaint the treatment during the course of which two of the nurses who were young women suffered similar attacks was continued for four months it was finally successful and consisted principally in the administration of opium at that time the favourite remedy now every species of enthusiasm every strong affection every violent passion may lead to convulsions to mental disorders to a concussion of the nerves from the sensorium to the very finest extremities of the spinal cord the whole world is full of examples of this afflicting state of turmoil which when the mind is carried away by the force of a sensual impression that destroys its freedom is irresistibly propagated by imitation those who are thus infected do not spare even their own lives but as a hunted flock of sheep will follow their leader and rush over a precipice so will whole hosts of enthusiasts deluded by their infatuation hurry on to a self-inflicted death such has ever been the case from the days of the milesian virgins to the modern associations for self-destruction of all enthusiastic infatuations however that of religion is the most fertile in disorders of the mind as well as of the body and both spread with the greatest facility by sympathy the history of the church furnishes innumerable proofs of this but we need go no further than the most recent times. End of chapter 4, section 1 Chapter 4, Sympathy, section 2 Example 3 In a Methodist chapel at Red Ruth, a man during divine service cried out with a loud voice, what shall i do to be saved at the same time manifesting the greatest uneasiness and solicitude respecting the condition of his soul 
some other members of the congregation following his example cried out in the same form of words and seemed shortly after to suffer the most excruciating bodily pain this strange occurrence was soon publicly known and hundreds of people who had come thither either attracted by curiosity or a desire from other motives to see the sufferers fell into the same state the chapel remained open for some days and nights and from that point the new disorder spread itself with the rapidity of lightning over the neighbouring towns of camborne helston truro penryn and falmouth as well as over the villages in the vicinity whilst thus advancing it decreased in some measure at the place where it had first appeared and it confined itself throughout to the methodist chapels it was only by the words which have been mentioned that it was excited and it seized none but people of the lowest education those who were attacked betrayed the greatest anguish and fell into convulsions others cried out like persons possessed that the almighty would straightway pour out his wrath upon them that the wailings of tormented spirits rang in their ears and that they saw hell open to receive them the clergy when in the course of their sermons they perceived that persons were thus seized earnestly exhorted them to confess their sins and zealously endeavoured to convince them that they were by nature enemies to christ that the anger of god had therefore fallen upon them and that if death should surprise them in the midst of their sins the eternal torments of hell would be their portion the over-excited congregation upon this repeated their words which naturally must have increased the fury of their convulsive attacks when the discourse had produced its full effect the preacher changed his subject reminded those who were suffering of the power of the saviour as well as of the grace of god and represented to them in glowing colours the joys of heaven upon this a remarkable reaction sooner or later took place those who were in convulsions felt themselves raised from the lowest depths of misery and despair to the most exalted bliss and triumphantly shouted out that their bonds were loosed their sins were forgiven and that they were translated to the wonderful freedom of the children of god in the meantime their convulsions continued and they remained during this condition so abstracted from every earthly thought that they stayed two and sometimes three days and nights together in the chapels agitated all the time by spasmodic movements and taking neither repose nor nourishment according to a moderate computation four thousand people were within a very short time affected with this convulsive malady the course and symptoms of the attacks were in general as follows there came on at first a feeling of faintness with rigour and a sense of weight at the pit of the stomach soon after which the patient cried out as if in the agonies of death or the pains of labour the convulsions then began first showing themselves in the muscles of the eyelids though the eyes themselves were fixed and staring the most frightful contortions of the countenance followed and the convulsions now took their course downwards so that the muscles of the neck and trunk were affected causing a sobbing respiration which was performed with great effort tremors and agitation ensued and the patients screamed out violently and tossed their heads about from side to side 
as the complaint increased it seized the arms and its victims beat their breasts clasped their hands and made all sorts of strange gestures the observer who gives this account remarked that the lower extremities were in no instance affected in some cases exhaustion came on in a very few minutes but the attack usually lasted much longer and there were even cases in which it was known to continue for sixty or seventy hours many of those who happened to be seated when the attack commenced bent their bodies rapidly backwards and forwards during its continuance making a corresponding motion with their arms like persons sawing wood others shouted aloud leaped about and threw their bodies into every possible posture until they had exhausted their strength yawning took place at the commencement in all cases but as the violence of the disorder increased the circulation and respiration became accelerated so that the countenance assumed a swollen and puffed appearance when exhaustion came on patients usually fainted and remained in a stiff and motionless state until their recovery the disorder completely resembled the st vitus's dance but the fit sometimes went on to an extraordinarily violent extent so that the author of the account once saw a woman who was seized with these convulsions resist the endeavours of four or five strong men to restrain her those patients who did not lose their consciousness were in general made more furious by every attempt to quiet them by force on which account they were in general suffered to continue unmolested until nature herself brought on exhaustion those affected complained more or less of debility after the attacks and cases sometimes occurred in which they passed into other disorders thus some fell into a state of melancholy which however in consequence of their religious ecstasy was distinguished by the absence of fear and despair and in one patient inflammation of the brain is said to have taken place no sex or age was exempt from this epidemic malady children five years old and octogenarians were alike affected by it and even men of the most powerful frame were subject to its influence girls and young women however were its most frequent victims example four for the last hundred years a nervous affection of a perfectly similar kind has existed in the shetland islands which furnishes a striking example perhaps the only one now existing of the very lasting propagation by sympathy of this species of disorders the origin of the malady was very insignificant an epileptic woman had a fit in church and whether it was that the minds of the congregation were excited by devotion or that being overcome at the sight of the strong convulsions their sympathy was called forth certain it is that many adult women and even children some of whom were of the male sex and not more than six years old began to complain forthwith of palpitation followed by faintness which passed into a motionless and apparently cataleptic condition these symptoms lasted more than an hour and probably recurred frequently in the course of time however this malady is said to have undergone a modification such as it exhibits at the present day women whom it has attacked will suddenly fall down toss their arms about writhe their bodies into various shapes move their heads suddenly from side to side and with eyes fixed and staring utter the most dismal cries 
if the fit happen on any occasion of public diversion they will as soon as it has ceased mix with their companions and continue their amusement as if nothing had happened paroxysms of this kind used to prevail most during the warm months of summer and about fifty years ago there was scarcely a sabbath in which they did not occur strong passions of the mind induced by religious enthusiasm are also exciting causes of these fits but like all such false tokens of divine workings they are easily encountered by producing in the patient a different frame of mind and especially by exciting a sense of shame thus those affected are under the control of any sensible preacher who knows how to administer to a mind diseased and to expose the folly of voluntarily yielding to a sympathy so easily resisted or of inviting such attacks by affectation an intelligent and pious minister of shetland informed the physician who gives an account of this disorder as an eye-witness that being considerably annoyed on his first introduction into the country by these paroxysms whereby the devotions of the church were much impeded he obviated their repetition by assuring his parishioners that no treatment was more effectual than immersion in cold water and as his kirk was fortunately contiguous to a fresh water lake he gave notice that attendants should be at hand during divine service to ensure the proper means of cure the sequel need scarcely be told the fear of being carried out of the church and into the water acted like a charm not a single naiad was made and the worthy minister for many years had reason to boast of one of the best regulated congregations in scotland as the physician above alluded to was attending divine service in the kirk of baliester in the isle of unst a female shriek the indication of a convulsion fit was heard the minister mr ingram of fettler very properly stopped his discourse until the disturber was removed and after advising all those who thought they might be similarly affected to leave the church he gave out in the meantime a psalm the congregation was thus preserved from further interruption yet the effect of sympathy was not prevented for as the narrator of this account was leaving the church he saw several females writhing and tossing about their arms on the green grass who durst not for fear of a censure from the pulpit exhibit themselves after this manner within the sacred walls of the kirk in the production of this disorder which no doubt still exists fanaticism certainly had a smaller share than the irritable state of women out of health who only needed excitement no matter of what kind to throw them into prevailing nervous paroxysms when however that powerful cause of nervous disorders takes the lead we find far more remarkable symptoms developed and it then depends on the mental condition of the people among whom they appear whether in their spread they shall take a narrow or an extended range whether confined to some small knot of zealots they are to vanish without a trace or whether they are to attain even historical importance End of chapter 4, section 2 Chapter 4, Sympathy, section 3 Example 5 The appearance of the convulsionnaires in France, whose inhabitants, from the greater mobility of their blood, have in general been the less liable to fanaticism, is in this respect instructive and worthy of attention 
in the year 1727 there died in the capital of that country the deacon Paris, a zealous opposer of the ultramontanists, division having arisen in the French church on account of the bull Unigenitus. People made frequent visits to his tomb in the cemetery of Saint Médard, and four years afterwards, in September 1731, a rumour was spread that miracles took place there patients were seized with convulsions and tetanic spasms rolled upon the ground like persons possessed were thrown into violent contortions of their heads and limbs and suffered the greatest oppression accompanied by quickness and irregularity of pulse this novel occurrence excited the greatest sensation all over paris and an immense concourse of people resorted daily to the above-named cemetery in order to see so wonderful a spectacle which the ultramontanists immediately interpreted as a work of satan while their opponents ascribed it to a divine influence this disorder soon increased until it produced in nervous women clairvoyance schlafwachen a phenomenon till then unknown for one female especially attracted attention who blindfold and as it was believed by means of the sense of smell read every writing that was placed before her and distinguished the characters of unknown persons the very earth taken from the grave of the deacon was soon thought to possess miraculous power it was sent to numerous sick persons at a distance whereby they were said to have been cured and thus this nervous disorder spread far beyond the limits of the capital so that at one time it was computed that there were more than eight hundred decided convulsionnaires who would hardly have increased so much in numbers had not louis the fifteenth directed that the cemetery should be closed the disorder itself assumed various forms and augmented by its attacks the general excitement many persons besides suffering from the convulsions became the subjects of violent pain which required the assistance of their brethren of the faith on this account they as well as those who afforded them aid were called by the common title of securists the modes of relief adopted were remarkably in accordance with those which were administered to the st john's dancers and the tarantati and they were in general very rough for the sufferers were beaten and goaded in various parts of the body with stones hammers swords clubs etc of which treatment the defenders of this extraordinary sect relate the most astonishing examples in proof that severe pain is imperatively demanded by nature in this disorder as an effectual counter-irritant the securists used wooden clubs in the same manner as paviors use their mallets and it is stated that some convulsionnaires have borne daily from six to eight thousand blows thus inflicted without danger one securist administered to a young woman who was suffering under spasm of the stomach the most violent blows on that part not to mention other similar cases which occurred everywhere in great numbers sometimes the patients bounded from the ground impelled by the convulsions like fish when out of water and this was so frequently imitated at a later period that the women and girls when they expected such violent contortions not wishing to appear indecent put on gowns made like sacks closed at the feet if they received any bruises by falling down they were healed with earth from the grave of the uncanonized saint 
they usually however showed great agility in this respect and it is scarcely necessary to remark that the female sex especially was distinguished by all kinds of leaping and almost inconceivable contortions of body some spun round on their feet with incredible rapidity as is related of the dervishes others ran their heads against walls or curved their bodies like rope dancers so that their heels touched their shoulders all this degenerated at length into decided insanity a certain convulsionnaire at vernon who had formerly led a rather loose course of life employed herself in confessing the other sex in other places women of this sect were seen imposing exercises of penance on priests during which these were compelled to kneel before them others played with children's rattles or drew about small carts and gave to these childish acts symbolical significations one convulsionnaire even made believe to shave her chin and gave religious instruction at the same time in order to imitate paris the worker of miracles who during this operation and whilst at table was in the habit of preaching some had a board placed across their bodies upon which a whole row of men stood and as in this unnatural state of mind a kind of pleasure is derived from excruciating pain some too were seen who caused their bosoms to be pinched with tongs while others with gowns closed at the feet stood upon their heads and remained in that position longer than would have been possible had they been in health pinot the advocate who belonged to this sect barked like a dog some hours every day and even this found imitation among the believers the insanity of the convulsionnaire lasted without interruption until the year seventeen ninety and during these fifty-nine years called forth more lamentable phenomena than the enlightened spirits of the eighteenth century would be willing to allow the grossest immorality found in the secret meetings of the believers a sure sanctuary and in their bewildering devotional exercises a convenient cloak it was of no avail that in the year seventeen sixty two the grand secours was forbidden by act of parliament for thenceforth this work was carried on in secrecy and with greater zeal than ever it was in vain too that some physicians and among the rest the austere pious hecke and after him lori attributed the conduct of the convulsionnaire to natural causes men of distinction among the upper classes as for instance montgeron the deputy and lambert an ecclesiastic obitus eighteen thirteen stood forth as the defenders of this sect and the numerous writings which were exchanged on the subject served by the importance which they thus attached to it to give it stability the revolution finally shook the structure of this pernicious mysticism it was not however destroyed for even during the period of the greatest excitement the secret meetings were still kept up prophetic books by convulsionnaires of various denominations have appeared even in the most recent times and only a few years ago in eighteen twenty eight this once celebrated sect still existed although without the convulsions and the extraordinarily rude aid of the brethren of the faith which amidst the boasted pre-eminence of french intellectual advancement remind us most forcibly of the dark ages of the st john's dancers example six 
similar fanatical sects exhibit among all nations of ancient and modern times the same phenomena an overstrained bigotry is in itself and considered in a medical point of view a destructive irritation of the senses which draws men away from the efficiency of mental freedom and peculiarly favours the most injurious emotions sensual ebullitions with strong convulsions of the nerves appear sooner or later and insanity suicidal disgust of life and incurable nervous disorders are but too frequently the consequences of a perverse and indeed hypocritical zeal which has ever prevailed as well in the assemblies of the menads and corybantes of antiquity as under the semblance of religion among the christians and mohammedans there are some denominations of english methodists which surpass if possible the french convulsionnaires and we may here mention in particular the jumpers among whom it is still more difficult than in the example given above to draw the line between religious ecstasy and a perfect disorder of the nerves sympathy however operates perhaps more perniciously on them than on other fanatical assemblies the sect of jumpers was founded in the year seventeen sixty in the county of cornwall by two fanatics who were even at that time able to collect together a considerable party their general doctrine is that of the methodists and claims our consideration here only in so far as it enjoins them during their devotional exercises to fall into convulsions which they are able to effect in the strangest manner imaginable by the use of certain unmeaning words they work themselves up into a state of religious frenzy in which they seem to have scarcely any control over their senses they then begin to jump with strange gestures repeating this exercise with all their might until they are exhausted so that it not unfrequently happens that women who like the menads practise these religious exercises are carried away from the midst of them in a state of syncope whilst the remaining members of the congregations for miles together on their way home terrify those whom they meet by the sight of such demoniacal ravings there are never more than a few ecstatics who by their example excite the rest to jump and these are followed by the greatest part of the meeting so that these assemblages of the jumpers resemble for hours together the wildest orgies rather than congregations met for christian edification in the united states of north america communities of methodists have existed for the last sixty years the reports of credible witnesses of their assemblages for divine service in the open air camp meetings to which many thousands flock from great distances surpass indeed all belief for not only do they there repeat all the insane acts of the french convulsionnaires and of the english jumpers but the disorder of their minds and of their nerves attains at these meetings a still greater height women have been seen to miscarry whilst suffering under the state of ecstasy and violent spasms into which they are thrown and others have publicly stripped themselves and jumped into the rivers they have swooned away by hundreds worn out with ravings and fits and of the barkers who appeared among the convulsionnaires only here and there in single cases of complete aberration of intellect whole bands are seen running on all fours and growling as if they wished to indicate 
even by their outward form the shocking degradation of their human nature at these camp meetings the children are witnesses of this mad infatuation and as their weak nerves are with the greatest facility affected by sympathy they together with their parents fall into violent fits though they know nothing of their import and many of them retain for life some severe nervous disorder which having arisen from fright and excessive excitement will not afterwards yield to any medical treatment but enough of these extravagances which even in our now days embitter the lives of so many thousands and exhibit to the world in the nineteenth century the same terrific form of mental disturbance as the st vitus's dance once did to the benighted nations of the middle ages End of chapter 4 End of the Dancing Mania by Justus Hecker Translated by Dr. Benjamin G. Babington